Hey everyone, thanks for joining. This is our Accountability and Transformative Justice 101 workshop. My name is Raquel Ortega. I use they them pronouns and I'm an organizer with ACLU of Northern California. So I hope you're in the right room. That's what we're gonna, what we're gonna be talking about today. Next slide. Awesome. So we are offering closed captions and interpretation in Spanish um, for folks who need that. Closed captions can be viewed by clicking on closed captions buttons on the bottom of your screen. Uh, puede ver los subtítulos haciendo clic en el botón closed caption que está en el parte inferior de su pantalla. Y si quieres español, entonces escoges español o estarán en inglés. Y puede acceder a inter interpretación en español haciendo clic en interpretation en la parte inferior, inferior de la pantalla y escogiendo Spanish. Next slide. Thanks. So we'd like to begin by acknowledging that all land in what is currently known as the United States is unceded indigenous territory, and that California is the occupied land of over 100 tribes. I'm zooming in today from Oakland, the occupied land of the Muekma Ohlone people and all people of the confederate, confederated villages of Lashon. To learn more about the land you're occupying, you can visit native-land.ca uh, as a good start. And I'll go ahead and add that into the chat. Um, but yeah, when we talk about the painful history upon which our country was founded, including state-sanctioned violence, state-funded genocide, the displacement and dispossession of ancestral lands, removal of children from their families and laws that seek to erase indigenous people altogether. It's just one small step towards racial and indigenous justice. I also think it's important to say that taking time for this during our presentation is you know, a really small piece, but that this is not a replacement for real transformative allyship with indigenous communities. And we really encourage you to support indigenous led work and campaigns. Next slide. In alignment with today's land acknowledgement, I want to introduce a, a quote by Aurora Levins Morales. She's a Puerto Rican author, artivist, uh, artist, activist, so artivist and historian. Um, is someone willing to read this quote for me? You can come off mute. I can do that. Great, thanks. Para crear movimientos capaces de transformar nuestro mundo, debemos tratar lo más posible de vivir con un pie en el mundo que aún no hemos creado. Which translates to, well, would you like me reading English as well, I guess? Sure. Um, in order to build movements capable of transforming our world, we have to do our best to live with one foot in the world we have not yet created. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And yeah, I chose this quote today as a reminder that building the world and society that we want requires moving towards a world that may only exist in our minds right now. Even when we can't imagine what it would look like, we may be able to imagine what it could feel like or what it smells like or tastes like. It may be clean water for all people, healthy lungs in children who breathe in air that's free of pollution or compassion and empathy from strangers and loved ones all around you. So I ask us to set an intention together to open our hearts and minds today to a growth mindset a mindset that believes that anyone and anything can change and invites us to begin to envision a new and different reality as we discuss concepts and frameworks that I believe can help us get there. Next slide. So before I jump into the program, I wanna do some acknowledgements and give some credit. Next slide. 
This workshop pieces together concepts and materials from various transformative justice and abolitionist authors, practitioners, and leaders, and I've listed all their names here. The key concepts are also from a workbook that I've used called Fumbling Towards Repair, which is a workbook for facilitators of um, community accountability and, and transformative justice. The framework around transformative justice was guide, also guided by videos uh, that were created by Project Nia and the Barnard Center for Research on Women, which all their videos are on YouTube. I highly encourage you to check them out in the future. Next slide. Cool, so our, our goals for this hour include breaking down key terms and frameworks discussing self and community accountability, and then doing an exercise together around the idea of pods and pod mapping. I intentionally made this workshop interactive, so I ask you to be ready to participate by typing in the chat and or raising your hand to come off mute to speak. So if you need to, grab a paper now. <laughs> so if you wanna take notes, otherwise you can you know, do the exercises in your head um, or yeah, think about it or type in the chat. And I'll send you this presentation and the recording afterwards. So if you don't have anything now, that's okay. Note that this is an introduction to these key terms and frameworks. We cannot possibly fit everything that has to do with transformative justice into one hour, but I hope that you leave today learning something new and with things that you can unpack after we leave together. Next slide. So I did wanna give a quick content warning. We do mention uh, violence um, and one specific example of violence, which I will give another content warning to at that time. I try not to go into too much detail, but we will be discussing you know, conflict, which does include violence. Um, so I, I encourage you to please take care of yourself as needed. And like I said, I'll try to give some more content warnings as things come up. Next slide. Okay, so I want us to start by having you think about what transformation feels like to you or think of a major transformation um, you've been through. So just think about it, take some time. Maybe like 30 seconds, or I'll give you some time. Yeah, think about what was it like? How did you know a transformation happened? How did you know you were different? Take a couple more seconds. Is there anyone who would like to share really briefly? Uh, Donna, I see your hand. Do you wanna come off mute? Yeah, um, when I was in college in uh, 1969, 1970, it was my first year of college. And um, sadly, I um, supported the Vietnam War. Mm. And then the Kent State students were killed and the Jackson State students were killed. And that totally, my th way of thinking just shifted 180 degrees. It opened up my viewpoint. It opened up my way of thinking. And I totally came against the war. And I actually went on strike and stopped going to my classes and camped out on the student quad for the rest of the semester. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it with these transformations, right, they often start with self-awareness and uh, sometimes right, it, it, it requires envisioning a different outcome and our goal. I think with your example was so great because sometimes uh, self-transformation can be like an intentional active process, but sometimes it happens after experiencing or reading about trauma or a drastic life change and then empathizing or like internalizing some of what happened. So yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Next slide. So 
now that we've talked a little bit about um, what self-transformation could look like, I'd like us to think about what it means or looks like to transform a society. What are the steps necessary to make it happen? We've had to start with, we'd have to start with some self-acknowledgement on a larger scale, but what else? You all wanna type some things into the chat? And I'm looking over, it says, transformation feels like growth and letting go of the hurt being part of me. Organizing, transformation feels like peace, wow. Also acknowledging not all transformation is positive. Accountability, we need equality, listening, educating ourselves, discussions. Ooh, Ginny wrote not normal. I'm very curious what about what that, um, that piece. Open hearts to hear the stories of those having different experiences than we have. Be part of a solution. Forgiveness for past mistakes. Discomfort. Accountability and healing, equality, ooh, immigration. Transformation is communicating and accepting our differences. Disobedience against existing curriculum. Got it. Cool, cool. Yeah, these are great. Um, and it definitely, I think, will take some time and a lot of practice and patience. Next slide. So you all already started kind of getting named some of these explicitly. Um, but I want to take some time to talk about how transformation, the idea of transformation relates to conflict. So in order to do that, I want us to break down some key terms. First, we have punishment. Punishment is suffering, pain, or loss that serves as retribution, penalty, or fee for wrongdoing. Next, we have consequences. This is the results or effects of an action or condition. Then we have justice, recognition of harm done, restitution, having resources to begin our healing path, putting in place resources to prevent more harm in the future. And finally, accountability, which I saw you all name. <laughs> Willingness to accept responsibility for one's harmful actions or behaviors. So we're going to go spend most of the time, pretty much the rest of the time, um, breaking down these terms and, and concepts together. So next slide. First, let's talk about punishment. Next slide. So we live in a society that broadly enforces punitive a punitive justice system or punitive system. It tells us that when you make a mistake, that you are wholly bad. You deserve to be punished, locked up and throw away the key. Next slide. Who here had an experience growing up where you were punished when you made a mistake? Type me in the chat if this was you. I'm gonna write me too, because that was also me. Yeah, y'all. Yeah, me or y'all, nice. Yeah, a lot of folks, a lot of folks. Next slide. So I want you uh, to, to name again, either typing in the chat or maybe raising your hand and then coming off mute. What does a punitive justice system teach us? What, were, what was something that you learned? And again, if we could try to keep these uh, brief, then we'll be able to hear from a lot more other, a lot more folks. Nothing, pain. And yeah, Gracie, thanks for, for uh, typing this in. Uh, to, don't try new things. That you are worthless. Um, can I say something? Sure. I think that, that a, punitive, then... a punitive justice system teaches us that um, there's no learning, mm. that there's no opportunity for trying again or second chances. Absolutely. 
I'm going to pause real quick and let Gracie catch up. Awesome. Um, it teaches us, yeah, to hide mistakes. Absolutely. You make a mistake. You have to hide, hide away from the world, get locked up, uh, not feeling validated. Mm, Donna, this is a good one. Uh, that there are bad people and good people. And I'll say even beyond that, it teaches us that people are static too, right? You're either good or you're bad. And oftentimes there's no room to change. Teaches that, that I'm bad, which is often associated with shame. Right. I've learned that, um, yeah, this teaches us about guilt and shame. The difference I've learned being that guilt often means I did something bad and shame means I am bad. And I think both of them exist within this. So these are all great. And, and yeah, I think that you all get it. Um, teaches us people should be punished no matter what the cause was of the mistake or crime, which is a great uh, segue into our next, our next piece. So let's go to the next slide. And then I'll do, we'll do the, the next one too. So what if conflict can be an opportunity to respond differently than what punitive justice has taught us? Next slide. So what happens when the original conditions were unjust? And this gets to what you all were talking about in the chat, right? What if, you know, for example, someone commits a crime, but the law that makes it a crime is unjust? Oftentimes that isn't taken into account in our current carceral system. Next slide. So now let's talk about consequences. Next slide. So consequences can be positive or negative. They aren't inherently one or the other. And I say that because oftentimes when we think of the word consequences, it is, um, people automatically think it's, it's negative, but again, that's really just kind of because we live in a punitive system. More and more studies are coming out showing how people are much more motivated by positive consequences, incentives, and positive reinforcement rather than punishment. Sometimes we have to implement specific consequences to an action, while other times there are natural consequences that happen. So I'll give you an example. Let's say there's a child who's eating ice cream and then throws it on the floor. The natural consequences is that that child no longer gets any ice cream, right? It's on the floor now. And an implemented consequence might be that the child is asked to clean up the ice cream on the floor. And then a punishment, going back to the last section, would be something maybe like an adult coming over and yelling at the child uh, for throwing the ice cream or like smacking them on the hand. Do we see the difference? Yeah. Uh, next slide. So this is a video. Oh, thanks, Carmel. <laughs> um, the reinforcements in the chat. So this is a video um, I wanna show you all by an elementary school educator. Honestly, I don't know anything about her or her politics, but I really like her lessons. So like, I'm not endorsing anybody. This is just a good video. Um, so we'll, I'll give Gracie a second to um, pull that up. See the video, Gracie. Okay, but we can one hear it. Second. I think I need to reshare my screen. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you for your patience, y'all. 
Yeah, I love what y'all are saying in the chat. It's great. Now, can you see it? Yeah, is there a way to make it bigger? I was wondering about that, but there is no enlarging or getting rid of these um, side bars. Got it. No worries. Okay, let me know when you're ready. Let's do it. Okay, thank you. I know it went, it went a little fast. Thanks so much, Gracie. Applauso. <laughs> um, I know it went a little fast, but but basically, right, what it said is that the teacher was having a hard time with certain behaviors of students. So she used this incentive of these like behavior uh, animals and specifically here was respectful rhino to teach the desired behavior. And the kids were so excited about getting to have um the the respectful rhino sit on their desk for the day that it really helped change their behavior so she also has like generous giraffe and patient parrot and things like that um so just wanted to give an example again that like consequences can be positive or in you know sentence incentives reinforcements can be a positive thing and it can also be something that's like chosen and figured out uh, by the community next slide uh great so how does this all relate to justice and transformative justice next slide so transformative justice is a political framework and approach for responding to violence, harm, and abuse. We do this by centering those who experience harm while maintaining relationship with those who caused the harm. Next slide. So the goals of transformative justice are survivor safety, healing and agency, accountability and transformation of those who abuse or cause harm, community response and accountability, and transformation of the community and social conditions that create and perpetuate violence. Next slide. So, at its most basic, transformative justice seeks to respond to violence without, while trying to not create more violence or by engaging in harm reduction to at least lessen the violence. Next slide. It offers a community-based response or intervention uh, transformative justice can be thought of as like, creating justice together. And again, we do this by centering those who experience harm while maintaining relationship with those who caused harm. Next slide. So transformative justice and community accountability must only happen outside of the state and its systems. Does anybody have an idea why? Why this might be the case? Yeah, the state is retaliatory, right? Because the state is a source of harm. The system is about punishment. That's exactly right. Um, the state, right, state responses to violence are violent themselves, and they often traumatize and re-traumatize those who are exposed to harm. Next slide.
So one example, uh, so I want to go through one possible process. I think I'm on the next slide. Thank you. So yeah, what does this process actually look like? Um, I want to give some steps to, uh, to outline one possible process. Um, so here's, here's the example. Um, so the first thing is, right, conflict, harm, or violence has occurred in our community. Step one, the first step would be to check in with those involved and ask what would be helpful, centering, again, those who experienced harm. Step two would be help those who did harm be accountable. Step three in this case would be restore the relationship. And I put a question mark because sometimes, right? Like I said, this is one example. Sometimes it's not possible to restore the relationship or sometimes that is not what the person who experienced harm uh, wants. And then the fourth piece being challenge the root systemic problems. So this is, this is a potential, you know, possible one possible uh, process, right? Some steps of what uh, transformative justice looks like. And so next slide, I want to give, show an example of how that would relate to real life. So this is Richie Ruseda. Um, I don't, you all might know Richie. Richie's a music, film, and content producer who was freed from prison in 20, 2018. Um, he created and co-hosts a really amazing original podcast on Spotify called Abolition X. And he also has many projects related to abolition and transformative justice. But most people know him from a CNN documentary that uh, chronicled incarcerated men uh, if, and feminist, uh, running a feminist program called The Feminist on Cell Block Y. So I want to share a short like TikTok, Instagram video that Richie made using the example of Will Smith slapping Chris Rock at the Oscars. So content warning, that's what it's going to talk about. Um, and yeah, to be clear, uh, this is not an invitation for folks to talk about whether they thought this was right or wrong or, you know, whether it was like deserved or not. This is just a very well-known example um, that, yeah, most people tend to know about. And what Richie does is walk you through what a transformative justice process could, could, could have looked like step by step. Um, so yeah, let's go to the video. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can make this one bigger, but I think this one's even smaller <laughs> than the last. So I hope that's okay, as long as y'all could hear it. Yeah, and I'll, uh, sorry, before you jump in, I did, I did take a quick look in the chat and I saw a question around, you know, the state or government cannot be transformed. That might mean voting doesn't matter. This one is hard for me. I totally hear you. And I'll say that I do believe that it's possible to change, to change our systems. I think that just the way that um, our current carceral system exists and the way our current um, legal system, it doesn't it doesn't operate from a framework of transformative justice, which is why um, we can't, it, we can't, uh, the framework doesn't fit within that. So that was really the point I was trying to make. I hope that's more clear, but you can type in the chat and let me know if it's not. Um, yeah, okay, so let's, let's go to the video. 
about what happens. Let's talk about what abolitionist responses to a situation like this could be. And you know, apply it in our own lives and mind our own business. The first thing we would do here from a transformative justice standpoint is talk to everybody who's been harmed. That means Chris, that means Will, and that means Jade. Give them an opportunity to feel heard and talk about what justice could look like for them and help them achieve their appropriate level of accountability, if any. And if they want, help restore the relationship. And we'd make sure our solutions help dismantle the system that led to the harm in the first place, which in this case was ableism and misogynoir, or the hatred of black women. Shout out to Denzel who stepped in as an elder and a transformative justice practitioner and low-key did elements of this already. Let's apply this solution-based way of thinking to our own conflicts and just stop throwing black women under the bus. What's the big deal? <laughs> First of all, is this a let's do we, maybe let's watch it one more time because Richie does talk really fast. Um, and I think the beginning got cut off a little bit. Let's watch it one more time. Society that relies on people with guns and badges to kidnap people and hold them against their will when we don't like them. Let's please not waste our time talking about how violence isn't the answer. And instead of wasting our time with arbitrary, imaginary conversations about who's right and who's wrong and who deserves to have what happens, let's talk about what abolitionist responses to a situation like this could be. And you know, apply it in our own lives and mind our own business. The first thing we would do here from a transformative justice standpoint is talk to everybody who's been harmed. That means Chris, that means Will, and that means Jane. Give them an opportunity to feel heard and talk about what justice could look like for them and help them achieve their appropriate level of accountability, if any. And if they want, help restore the relationship. And we'd make sure our solutions help dismantle the system that led to the harm in the first place, which in this case was ableism and misogynoir, or the hatred of black women. Shout out to Denzel who stepped in as an elder and a transformative justice practitioner and low-key did elements of this already. Let's apply this solution-based way of thinking to our own conflicts and just stop throwing black women under the bus. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Gracie. So, yes, yeah, so he was using the, the Chris and Will Smith situation as an example um, and talking through, you know, who would who they would talk to in that, you know, who, who would be talked to in that situation, right? Um, asking like what would be helpful, working to um, repair the relationship if that was what needed. And then also, right, naming different elements like ableism and misogynoir um, or the hatred of Black women around, um, yeah, and why this was possible in the first place, right? Um, so of course we need to ask ourselves, there, there's a lot more to these, these steps, right? Oftentimes we need to ask ourselves and each other additional questions, including like, why did the harm happen, right? What, what were the, uh, underlying, uh, conditions that, uh, and dynamics that were at play and what allowed things to escalate, um, yeah, next slide. Thank you. I also think it's important to name, and I, I said this before, that processes are going to look different and that's okay. We cannot limit transformation to one idea or embodiment when we are of different communities. Uh, I, I think I meant to write identities, <laughs> cultures and experiences. Next slide. Oh, oh, I see someone wrote, how does this work when the people hurt only want to punish the perpetuator as an outcome? Great question. I, uh, I will, we're going to get to that. <laughs> so uh, the last piece I wanted to ask to talk about is accountability. So next slide. So going to our key terms again. Uh, accountability means willingness to accept responsibility for one's harmful actions or behaviors. Next slide. So this is this is going to start going into some of what you all were talking about in the chat. So punishment is not justice. And remember, guilting, shaming, or causing others to suffer, you know, is not justice. And this is really tricky. It's really hard because sometimes there is a clash between what will actually make people feel safer and what makes us feel better, right? 
But the, the point of, uh, or really what transformative justice teaches us is that justice is not revenge or retaliation. And it's going to take a lot of practice and a lot of uh, reframing and support in order to um, in order to be able to to feel good about that. Next slide. I'll also add that accountability is not revenge or punishment as well, right? Part of what we all talked about when we were talking about punitive systems and how it it. It makes it impossible for us to learn from our mistakes. It makes us not interested in learning or doing better because um, yeah, it, 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 it punishes us instead. Whereas accountability is a way for us to really show up for one another. So accountability is not, not revenge or punishment. And that means, you know, telling someone that the things that they did wrong and how they need to change and do things differently, right, is, is not accountability. That can only really come from the person who caused the harm. Next slide. So this becomes tough, right? Because it's like, well, what if somebody isn't willing to accept accountability, right? Um, so, you know, we can't control other people, but we can work on this for ourselves. We, what we know is that true accountability only happens within relationships. And that's why the very first thing that the state does when addressing violence oftentimes is breaking relationships and removing people altogether. I see a lot of people typing in the chat, so I'm gonna take I'm gonna pause real quick and move over and see. Most people don't feel better after some kind of retribution, but people in restorative justice systems who have agency in how the people who have harmed them are held accountable do better. The quality of, ju of being just or fair. Mm -hmm. I would have appreciated to be apologized to from the people who caused me harm. Then I would know that they knew, then I would know that they knew that they harmed me and it wasn't okay. I think that's so good. And like, I think that that's such a great example of, you know, re self reflection and figuring out, you know, what, what would feel supportive for you? What would repair feel like for you? Cool, cool. Um, yeah, people often disagree over what they deserve and whether they're receiving it. That's a really good point too. Um, so next slide. So yeah, how do we even learn? How do we even learn what self-accountability is, right? When we're raised in a culture that says, you know, that people that, that we're, you know, when we're, uh, we do something bad, we're garbage, canceled, thrown away, all these things, right? It, it makes it so difficult to even want to be accountable. Um, so we've li I've listed some steps here that you can take in order to practice that. And it sounds like some of y'all maybe already incorporate this in some of your lives. Um, so checking in with yourself when making choices, becoming aware of the values you have in any given situation, be honest with yourself about what you feel and what you want. Asking yourself why you made the choices that you did in the past. And then next slide. And then thinking about what you need in order to make choices in the future or in order to change your behavior so that your actions are more in line with your values. So one value for me that I think about all the time is like honesty. Oftentimes, every day, people often make like little tiny untruths or fibs, right? And I think, um, you know, it's good to be like often, like sometimes it, it might not be harmful at all. Like it doesn't really make an impact, but that is something where 
um, it can be really good to check in with yourself and say like, why do I do this? Or, you know, is, are there certain conditions or patterns that I need to be aware of in which this happens more often? Um, and that can be the same case where for when folks have, um, are, 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 uh, dishonest and like big lies, right. Um, or, uh, dishonest with themselves and others, these are all, you know, identifying your values for me is a really good way to um, be self-reflective and then be accountable. Next slide. Okay, so edgy moment ahead. And edgy just means like, this is, I'm gonna talk about a thing that may feel a little bit crunchy. There's a little bit of an edge to it, may feel a little sharper, challenging. Next slide. We need each other to end violence, which means no one is disposable. And, you know, we can discuss the effectiveness of cancel culture all we want. We can talk about that offline if you want, um, or like in a separate training as well. But what I want to emphasize here is that we can't end violence alone right? We really, we do need each other and we need to um, build this into other systems and institutions in order to really create large scale change. Next slide. And it's also important to recognize that conflict, harm, and violence are inevitable. And I know this feels hard because we're like, ooh, what do you mean? Like, conflict violence is inevitable is that can't be true but even the most well-intentioned people can cause harm or violence we've all done it but what really matters here is how we address it the decisions that we can make um and and having that control for ourselves on what deciding what to do moving forward Yes, having a culture, creating a culture of accountability and validation, absolutely. So next, uh, that y'all are like setting me up. This is perfect. So, right, a culture of accountability means having community accountability. So note, this does require a voluntary community participation. So that you know, somebody had asked a question before about, you know, what happens if someone doesn't want to participate? Again, we can't force people to participate in this, but we do, we oftentimes do get to choose who is a part of our community and who isn't. Community accountability is a process in which a community works together to affirm values, develop sustainable strategies, and commit to the ongoing development and support of all members. So a community can be like a group of friends, a family. It can be a apartment complex or your workplace even, or a, a, something like a neighborhood. Next slide. Yes, accountability increases effectiveness 100%. So the last exercise that I want us to do today is figuring out who we can call on for a community accountability within our own lives. And these groups are called pods. Next slide. So your pod is made up of the people that you would call on if violence, harm, or abuse happens to you. Uh, or the people that you would call on if you wanted support in taking accountability for violence, harm, or abuse that you've done, or if you witnessed violence or if someone you care about was being violent or being abused. So I want to note that people can have multiple pods, right? The people you call for support when you're being harmed may not be the same people you call on for support when you have done harm, vice versa. In general, your pod people can often uh, are often those that you have relationship and trust with, though everyone has different criteria for your pods. Next slide. So I want you to take the next two minutes. I'm going to go ahead and set my timer. 
and actually map out who are the people you would call on for your pods. And we can go to the slide before if you need help, like figuring out which, which pods, uh, groups of pods <laughs> you want. But I do want us to take a minute and just figure out like what, who are those people in my life? Okay, we'll go. And I realized I should have maybe tried to play some music. Can you hear this? Yeah. When I wake up in the morning, love, and the sunlight hurts my eyes, and something without warning, love. That's heavy on my mind Then I look at you And the world's all right with me One more minute Just one look at you And I know it's gonna be A lovely day all right um finish up your last notes let's go to the next slide cool so what was that process like does anybody want to type in the chat or raise your hand and come off mute to share what that was like mapping out the people in your pods for me conscious leadership mutual friend in the pod or co-parent ooh i love that luke it create did it carmel did it create a, a sense of safety for you or did it like uh, yeah, I'm curious. Knowing I can reach out to someone. I love that. Loke, I see your hand raised. You want to come off mute? Yeah, um, I, it's a really good process. It's something that like, I've actually been starting to take a really nice uh, lens to after a conflict happened in a group. And, you know, talking to somebody who has um, conflict resolution experience, in this case, a um, somebody who's just a preschool teacher um, mm -hmm. that, and um, that being in one of these processes myself at the moment, that it has felt really good to, and more connective to be able to integrate into community, even within conflict, because it still feels like coming together rather than coming apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I also see someone typed, I just had lots of questions about how a pod would work in practice and how it would affect who I would bring in or not. Yeah. Surprised it was hard to come up with many people. Totally, totally. And I'll, I can tell you, there are many people who do not have any pod people, right? This is a very real reality for many um, people, especially I'll say oppressed and isolated communities um, and in individuals. I think because, right, like capitalism, oppression and violence all shape our lives and really kind of encourage isolation. 
Um, yeah, and and yeah, there's a lot of reasons why people are often isolated. So don't feel bad if you had a hard time naming folks or figuring out who might fit into what pods. I promise this is, you know, you're not graded on this or anything. Uh, I said, all right, I see my therapists and close friends are part of my pod, although I think it depends on the context too, because then maybe I'd incorporate family members. Yeah, that's great. I would definitely include my therapist in my pod. Um, who, who are the voices I trust not only to look after me, but also to hold me accountable and help me grow for real, right? Do you have people who just agree with you all the time with everything, you know, that you name, or do you have people who really tell you when you're wrong, right? Very context-based, different pods for work conflict, family conflict, friends, Mm hmm. I um, the same at the same time, the pod would be built of the people who I'd have conflict with family members for family conflict, coworkers for work conflict. Yeah, I think that's very similar for me, too. There's there's less it, uh, less times when I feel like they would cross over. Hesitant to reach out to folks whose values I'm um, unsure of, a.k.a. law enforcement, state supported institutions. Yeah, these are all so great. Thank you. Um, let's go back and then, yeah, let's move to the next slide. Yeah. So like I was saying, you know, most people have few solid dependable relationships in their lives. Many people have less people that they could call on to take accountability for harm they've done than harm that happened to them. And then pod people often times, yeah, don't fall neatly along traditional lines. So these are all things that you all were naming as coming up in this um, in this process, right? And much of this, so yeah, through, uh, for many people, yeah, mapping their pod is just like a very sobering process. Um, and for for others, it can be a surprise to uh, think about maybe your your pod was actually larger than you initially thought it was too. So wanted to name that. Next slide. So in terms of what everyday transformative justice and accountability practices look like, you know, we've only barely just touched on these key concepts, like I said. But already these are things we can start incorporating into our lives. You know, de-escalation, just practice having hard conversations in your life, um, right? Practicing uh, talking about the difference between accountability and justice and uh, punishment and consequences, right? These are all the everyday things we can start doing now. Um, practice resolving smaller conflicts to reduce moments of crises. And again, start practicing doing this in your pods or in community spaces. Everyone, and then everyone is engaged in their own processes, processes of healing and self-reflection of the impact, which includes that self-accountability piece that we talked about earlier and all of those steps. Next slide. So um, in terms of what happens next, you know, we're at the end of this uh, workshop. I'm going to stay on to answer questions that folks have, and we can talk about this a little bit more. Um, we do want to have a Transformative Justice 102 um, workshop. That In that one, it will, it will be a little bit longer. That one will probably be 90 minutes. And that's where we'll really like dig into different like scenarios and case studies and where I hope to also um, talk more about, yeah, just like what if situations and, and some of the, uh, the, the trickier pieces around transformative justice. But I'm really glad we were able to come together and take the time to just like get on the same page around our language and thinking through uh, the pieces around, you know, self-accountability, um, community accountability and, and understanding TJ 
on a on a basic level. Um, I also wanted to name there's an election coming up and um, we are uh, after the election, we are hosting a post election debrief. I will go ahead and paste a, a link into the chat for that so that uh, if you're interested in participating, you can join us. And then otherwise, next slide. Yeah, let's go ahead and jump into some questions that folks have around this. And thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna stop the re uh, recording. Um, so I'll be sure to send this out to everybody with all the information, um, but would love to hear about some of what you have going on in your mind um, after hearing all of this. So thanks. <laughs>